Um, so somehow uh, on the import, uh, the PowerPoint lost all my cool, sleek fonts, which is why it looks like the 1970s. Um, just know that it's it was a really good deck. Um, uh, so I'm a, hold on, I, I want to figure this out because it's going to keep going and that's going to be terrible. Um, PowerPoint. All right. We'll, we'll deal. We'll deal. Um, so, uh, my name is Juan Velez. I'm a recovering journalist and uh, uh, recovering journalist turned civic technologist with Open City, which is a group based in Chicago. Um, I'm going to give you a view of OpenGov practice from the trenches um, with an accent on civic hacking, which is this weird emerging thing where um, citizens get together and build things with some of the open data the cities and uh, counties and the states are releasing. Um, so first I'll give you, I'll bring you up to speed on what's been going in, in Chicago. Um, and this was spoiled for you already, I'm sorry. Uh, but you might have heard that we got a new mayor recently and for whatever reason this guy was way more into open data than the old guy. Um, and so he started releasing a bunch of data on a fabulous looking data portal. Um, and when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm talking about open data, I'm really talking about like boring spreadsheets. Data is super, super boring. It's the most, I'm bored just talking about it right now. But, the th <laughs> but what's, interesting, what's interesting is doing something with it. What's interesting is treating it as a raw material for experimentation and for innovation. And so that's what we've been trying to do. Um, so a bunch of boring stuff gets put online and then people like me start to hack with it, start to make little th little experiments, start to make little apps, and start to make little analyses and whatnot. Um, and uh, uh, Open City is just one of the groups that's emerged out of that. Um, uh, we are kind of, you can think of us as a, as a civic tech prototyping lab. We, our approach to answering all these questions we've been raising today about the potential, the limits, and the ethics of transparency of open data, uh, we decided to answer them by just making stuff and throwing it against the wall. Uh, and so this chat is about what we've learned and uh, what we've learned about getting to impact with this stuff, which is my personal interest. So um, <clears throat> first, we uh, took a look at lobbying. Uh, this is every single uh, person that has lobby in the city. Again, a boring spreadsheet. Um, uh, but um, we turned that into... Chicago lobbyists. This was our first project. It's kind of like a Facebook for lobbyists in Chicago. Um, so you can um, see who's lobbying uh, city departments and city legislators and kind of drill down and see exactly who they've been trying to procure business from and exactly how much money they made last year and so on. And this all comes from lobbyist disclosure reports that were previously open in that you could A, never find out about them, B, walk to city hall and C, uh, deal with the ornery uh, 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 lady in the front desk to get at this stack of paper. Um, so this is a very different world that we're in all of a sudden. And you might know that Chicago's political system has a reputation for being kind of a little bit corrupt historically. Um, and yet this is the first time that, um, that Chicagoans have actually been able to see how lobbying works at City Hall, at least at a high level. We don't exactly know what business is procuring, but at least we know that they're up, that they're up to something now. For better or worse, I'm not being conspiratorial. I'll leave that to the Sunlight Foundation. Um, just kidding. Uh, but this, what, what's interesting about this is that it's, it's kind of a, uh, uh, I already said that point. So the next point, um, the, 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 this might be pretty. I think we did a pretty good job with the design, but, the, but it's got a problem, which is that it's too open-ended. So you see, you can, you, there's any number of ways into this thing, but it doesn't necessarily tell you a comparing story. It doesn't answer a question. What we've been finding is that um, useful transparency apps answer real questions people have, specific, real, everyday questions people have. Um, so for after this, we started asking questions. Um, in January of 2012, uh, the city released, uh, city of Chicago released Plow Tracker, which basically lets you see where the plows are in real time during a snowstorm. Um, and we thought it was a really good step forward. The problem was it looks like this. So you, you learn one thing, there's plows everywhere. There are, there are plows all over the damn place. You just don't, you just, it doesn't tell you that much about how the city's plow deployment is going. It doesn't tell you that much about whether your street's been plowed. <clears throat> and so we decided to um, 
uh, take this data. We actually reverse engineered their app and pulled the, the data because they had they, they, they told us they were, they were going to take their time with an API. So we're like, okay, we'll just take your data. Um, and we ended up uh, overnight, the night before the second snowstorm, uh, built this thing, Clear Streets, lets you basically see whether your street has been plowed. You punch in your address and it takes you to your block and then you can see when, wh whether and when your street has been plowed by the city. Um, <clears throat> so what did this particular transparency experiment reveal? Something uh, incredibly mundane and incredibly important, which is that the city actually does a good job <laughs> on, on plowing. And contrary to popular belief, the Alderman Street doesn't get plowed first and the hood doesn't get plowed last. And if you ever read the Chicago Tribune's comments, this is what everyone in the world believes, and it's not true. And we could see that. You can, you can unambiguously see that from this stupid little map we, put, we hacked together overnight. Um, the other thing is we also discovered the bureaucracy. Um, as a lot of you guys know, uh, using open data responsibly means doing your research, which inevitably means talking to bureaucrats. And this part usually takes two, three, four times longer than actually coding up whatever it is you're doing. Um, each project we do then we end up actually like talking to a new segment of city government and we discover the bureaucracy and they discover us. It's a very titillating process. Um, uh, the, an, an, another more recent one we've done is, uh, uh, is much, much wonkier than, than some of the other things we've done. So it, it, Chicago's has pretty bad public schools like many major American cities except there are some really, really good ones but of course you have to apply to get in. And the way that those schools try to maintain social economic diversity um, is that they have, they used to have racial quotas, straight up racial quotas. We'll take this many black kids, this many Hispanic kids, this many white kids. But the court shot that down about 10 years ago. Uh, and so they've tried to essentially do the same thing by, um, by going uh, for socioeconomic quotas. Chicago's highly, uh, highly segregated, so you can pretty much get the same effect if you just say, we're going to cut up the, the, the city of Chicago into four socioeconomic bins, depending on where you live, depending on the wealth of your neighborhood. So what you're seeing there, uh, uh, the, the tier fours, the really blue ones, those are very wealthy. And then the, as you get to kind of white, that's, that's, um, that's less wealthy. And <clears throat> the reason we ended up doing this, again, another map, it, take, it took us like two days to do, maps, we do too many maps, but the reason that this is valuable is not obvious from just seeing this thing and, and, and hearing about it. Uh, if you're a parent, it used to be a huge pain to find out about these tiers. First of all, you have to know that they exist at all, and then you have to wrap your head around how they work, which is quite complicated. So that is already an incredibly regressive um, uh, obstacle to accessing the school system and therefore to getting ahead and, and all those good things. Um, but then if you actually wanted to just answer the simple question, what tier do I live in? You used to have to go to this, you used to have to find a page buried in the Chicago Public Schools website. You used to have to follow instructions that would take you to the census website where you would look up your census tract ID and then come back to the main site, scroll through a huge PDF and find what tier your, your census tract ID corresponded to, right? So this is, <laughs> this is just like excruciating and, and um, and tractable, so we, we fixed that problem. Now, we didn't fix education, we didn't even make uh, selective enrollment schools that much easier to get into, but we did do something something little, and it sparked a lot of conversation, which is some, one of the more interesting outcomes of some of the work that we've done. Um, <coughs> because even though this is much less sexy than the lobbyist project, uh, it gets orders of magnitude more traffic than anything else we've done. And we get email, we get fan mail all the time from parents about this thing. And it took, it took us a while to actually understand why. Uh, until it really, what helps me think about it is a distinction between a painkiller and a vitamin that some people in the startup world talk about. So uh, a painkiller, a vitamin is something you take because you're supposed to take it. And you take it, you don't feel particularly better, but you're supposed to take a vitamin. A painkiller is something you take because your back is killing you, right? So lobbyist is a vitamin. Not a lot of people actually depend on it to make everyday decisions, unless you're a lobbyist, maybe. Um, but thousands of parents are scrambling every day to make sense of the tier system and to get their kids into top schools. So that's a much easier sell. And it's much easier to actually get adoption, which is pretty important key to, to impact. Um, <clears throat> and as a byproduct of this, again, remember the discovering the bureaucracy part, we ended up doing so much research for this, it took hours and hours and hours, it took 10 times as long than it took to actually make the map. Um, and so we ended up writing this pretty thorough about page that not only explains the tier system, it explains different CPS schools, and I am sad to say <laughs> that this is, the best, um, this is the best explanation of how selective enrollment tiers work 
on the web. I'm sad to say because that should be government's job, not my job, to do that. Um, and um, but we did it, and we also ended up actually deconstructing the whole pol public policy of tiers and finding out that they're pretty bad. It's like a pretty bad policy because if you're taking, uh, it works with averages. So let's say the median in or median income of this segment of the city is fifty thousand dollars. Well, what if you're actually in the thirty thousand dollars slot? Then it's it can be harder for you to get into a school, even though you might be more deserving. Um, so. We discovered, we, we explained some policy, we, 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 we critiqued the policy, and um, that, that was our, that was, those were the vitamins that came out of this. Uh, and we discovered that uh, a lot of people were reading the vitamins after going there for a very practical reason. So the lesson here is that um, uh, you fix, you, 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 you give people painkillers before vitamins, and, and that's, when they'll, that's when they'll take, that's when they'll eat their transparency vegetables. Um, the other thing that's been nice and really fun is that working at the city level is, is the best. You can, because you can actually see and smell uh, government public services and infrastructure. It's all around you. Uh, why, has my, how, why hasn't my street been, uh, been plowed yet? Well, because the city didn't get to it last night. Why is that? Because their budget cuts mean that they don't get to the side streets as quickly now. Like you can trace every, every decision that goes to city hall to something that's on your block. Um, or even every decision that's made in Congress, for that matter. Uh, so, uh, it, and it's not just things like plows. It's like why why is that uh, drive-through bank slicing through that nice walkable uh, set of storefronts? Well, because the alderman carved out a one a, a, a zoning district for just that particular property. Um, we have an app that also shows that kind of thing. Um, the bigger point here is that because municipal government is so place-based, there's actually a huge opportunity to use the city itself as an interface for open government. No matter how pretty and well-marketed, very few people will ever look at a budget website, and we've made a couple, and it's like, it's good, it's pretty, there's nice charts, but you know, that's not how I spend my, my Sundays, and, and, uh, and, and that's okay. But the budget is still all around us when we walk around. It's, it's the mental health clinic we walk to on the way to work. It's the, um, it's the station renovation, the subway stop renovation, uh, that Emmanuel has, because he's a smart politician, has started branding. Every single pothole that's getting filled, every bridge has got his name on it. So you can, see, you can think of that as very cynical and political, or you can think of it as actually branding government, actually spreading awareness about the stuff government does day to day. I think it's probably both. Um, but the bigger point is, what if you could learn about government from the street? You wouldn't have to end up finding out through Google that there's some budget website. You could just say, wow, they're renovating the, the subway. I wonder what's up with that. Uh, go to the QR code with your cell phone and learn all kinds of things about it. Um, so we've kind of taken this journey in trying to figure out what you could do with open data to have uh, impact. We've gone from the kind of traditional transparency project that lobbyist was to the more urban transparency thing of the plows to citizen pain killing. That's kind of our thing now. And it's, it's good. People, people love you when you do that. Um, <coughs> now, uh, we were kind of lonely, and because we're nerds, but also, since the point is to have impact, you want to get more than just three nerds to do this stuff in a city like Chicago. It's a big city. You saw the original, right? Big city. Um, and so we decided to get other people involved, which is the second part of my tale. But before I get to this next part, I want to make one thing very clear. I, think, I really think we need to tone down the messianic rhetoric around civic hackathons. Because, for example, the, the White House is having a summer of civic hacking this summer. And if you read the thing, it's like super sexy. It's like, oh man, you're gonna get to like fix your city in one weekend. You'll just eat, drink beer and eat pizza and it's done, it's done, we fixed it. Um, so let's get real and just admit that nights and weekend projects can't solve entrenched social problems or transform the whole public sector. Um, uh, they're very useful for other things. They're very useful for community building. Uh, if, it's, if, they're, if it's a happening, let's, let's proudly call it a happening. I'm down with that. Um, at the same time, though, there, there really are a lot of low-hanging fruit projects that you could do out. And so we set out to see, like, what it would take to organize civic hackers in a city for impact and how far you could actually go. So here are the main obstacles we found to doing that. One, can be really hard to get civically curious technologists because most of them rather make a, mil you know, a million bucks with some stupid startup. Um, Two, it's very hard, this is the hardest part actually, it's actually finding the right problem to solve. It's so easy to be like, oh man, wouldn't it be cool if like, blah, 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 we all do this all the time. It's a very important, uh, it's very important because it gets people excited, but actually 
the problem is that the projects that work are the ones where you spend the five hours actually going to talk to people and, and getting ideas that way. The last thing is we just don't have, uh-oh, I'm out of time. Okay, I'll race really quick. Um, we don't have the, the, the budget or the time to actually do marketing on these things. Um, so our solution has been to uh, do these open government weekly hack nights where we get uh, technologists from the city together and we get uh, the city to come in and pitch problems ideas. So they already know what problems they have and then they help us with the promotion later on. And it's kind of, it started off with uh, four geeks in a room and now it's up to 40 every week, which is kind of ludicrous. Um, and there have been a number of, of success stories that I can't talk to you about because I'm out of time.